wanted to do was talk a little bit today about where we are in COVID and how that impacts our budget and how that impacts our economy. So with that, um, we have our old friend Melissa McCall to tell us a little bit about the budget, uh, not just this past year, but what it looks like in this current fiscal year. And uh, I think many of you know Kevin Lembo, who um, we need him to certify that what we're doing uh, makes sense. And uh, he's a great friend and his own man independently elected to give you an independent certification. Uh, with that, let me just quickly give you our um, COVID-19 numbers. That's 220 positive cases out of uh, almost 14,000 tests performed. 14,000 tests performed, if you can do the math, is, you know, we're still running at over 100,000 tests a week, which is um, some of the highest. But um, 220 positive cases is concerning. 220 positive cases is an infection rate of about 1.6%. Um, that's still one of the lowest in the country, but it is a trend. And uh, you say, what happened a month or so ago? You were bouncing around 0.8%. Now you're at 1.6%. And uh, this has continued on for a couple of weeks. And I do look at Rhode Island. I do look at New York. And I see some similar trends out there. I can identify flare-ups in Danbury. I can identify flare-ups in um, you know, parts of Mansfield. But, uh, this is something we're watching carefully. See whether, to what degree it's seasonal, degree, what degree it is people coming back, what degree it is Labor Day weekend, and it's uh, you know, a few weeks later. But uh, all those folks who are, think we're, we're out of the woods and it's time just to um, let it rip, uh, this reminds you uh, why we continue to be very cautious and uh, why I've said on a number of occasions that I think this next two or three months are really key to uh, what we do going forward. You know, 75 in the hospital. We haven't had 75 in the hospital since uh, early July. Remember, we had 2,000 COVID-related illnesses in the hospital going back uh, six months. So uh, 75 is just a little trend that we're watching because it's uh, continued for a bit. Let's move to uh, what that means in terms of our financial outlook as a state. Um, here, um, in the short term, Connecticut, I think, has done very well. Uh, Believe it or not, we recorded a surplus of uh, about $39 million for the fiscal year that ended June 30, uh, provided the controller is willing to certify something like that. Um, there are very few states that showed a surplus. I remember a lot of people thought my friend uh, Melissa was being overly aggressive in her revenue assumptions last year. Uh, she's never too aggressive. She's always cautious, uh, to which I uh, really have respect in terms of how we had to balance those numbers. In addition, the Budget Reserve Fund, um, a.k.a. the Rainy Day Fund, we made another significant deposit into that fund, $569 million. You'll see in the next slide, it's the you know, highest we've ever had in the Rainy Day Fund. And that's 15 percent of our budget. That's what the legislature uh, you know, stipulated going back when they created the Rainy Day Fund. The, our rainy day fund, 50 percent, is the seventh strongest in the country. And, um, you, you know, know, we'll be able to tell you as we look into the 2021 budget why that's very impactful. You may say, well, who's stronger than us at 15 percent? I mean, some of those oil and gas states like Wyoming or Alaska, it's like Saudi Arabia. They have a sovereign wealth fund, you know, maybe 100 percent. But uh, in terms of um, normal states, it's the best we've ever been. 15 percent also means that we'll be able to, for the first time ever, transfer some money to the pension plan, which means retire some of those pension obligations. And that, that's enormously important for us. Uh, never done before. Uh, Connecticut, we're 19th out of 50 states in terms of economic bounce back. Uh, what does that mean? That means um, we, while we have about 95 percent of our economy is open, uh, a little over 85 percent of our economy has bounced back to where it was pre-COVID. Um, the average for the United States is about 80 uh, percent. Obviously, not obviously, but New York and New Jersey are much lower. You say, why are you the second best of your regional peers? Who's beating you? Uh, darn it, that's Rhode Island. But I, I think um, because of manufacturing, because of uh, health care, because of outdoor construction, We've been able to keep a higher percentage, not, a, not just of our economy open, but um, slowly uh, getting our GDP back. 
Uh, that's not necessarily reflected in the unemployment numbers because there were about average compared to uh, the other 49 states. But it is, just gives you an idea of where we stand compared to our peers, which in the short term is pretty good. Uh, this next chart is, um, it tells me a couple of things. A, the blue line, account balance, rainy day fund, highest ever, you know, that's a good, that's a good thing. I've got other states, my neighbors are borrowing money to pay short term, um, you know, cash flow needs. That's not the state of Connecticut. Not only do we have a surplus, we're putting money in the bank for that rainy day. But it's worth looking at that dark red line heading down in 2010. And it just reminds you how volatile that stream can be as well in a severe recession. I think we're prepared. Challenges do remain. And uh, there I just wanted to give you a couple of heads up before uh, Melissa goes. Um, first of all, we're going to have a much better idea of uh, what our 2021 budget looks like uh, once we have a little more indication from the federal government. Um, they really kept the economy going up through June 30. They handed out trillions of dollars. So that meant that our uh, revenues really did not take um, a severe hit. I think it was um, you know, 2.3 percent hit. So our revenues being mainly uh, income tax and sales tax. Uh, sales tax has benefited a lot because you started doing a lot more buying online. Like it or not, we have a, um, a tax on internet sales, so that held our um, our sales tax revenues pretty strong. Um, so that you know was really key in terms of 2020. 2021 again, it's not when you say support from the federal government, it's not simply aid to state and local governments but what they're going to do generally for the economy, what they're going to do for unemployment, what they're going to do to shore up small business, or you may see an uncertain revenue uh, forecast, um, which we'll have a lot more uh, clarity on over the course of the next um, you know, few months again. Uh, right now, um, glass half empty, Melissa has deficits projected at about uh, three and a half a billion over the course of the next uh, two years. And uh, we're following that very closely. And uh, the debt and unfunded liabilities, 33% of GDP. I, I want you to know that, look, in the near term, Connecticut is pretty well positioned compared to our peers. In the near term, we have a rainy day fund. In the near term, our economy has performed better than it, um, true of most of those other states. But I've got to tell you, uh, debt and unfunded pension liabilities is a big deal. Uh, we are probably have more debt and unfunded pension uh, than any other state in the country is a percentage of GDP, as this says, or, um, or per capita. So that's why um, Melissa and I have been very strict uh, when it comes to, um, you know, debt, and at least we're beginning to pay down some of those unfunded liabilities for the very first time. But what else could we do going forward in this next uh, budgetary session that would give us more confidence as we try and rein in spending and uh, maximize our output and then nothing like economic growth to get the revenues going again. So the legislature in their wisdom back uh, a couple of years ago, they directed the governor to hire a national consultant to identify efficiencies. And uh, that is what uh, Melissa is, is doing now. And um, she and Josh Jabal are looking at not just efficiencies in a broad sense, but thinking um, proactively, because we probably will have 25, 30 percent of our state employees reaching the age of retirement. There's some changes in the pension calculation, which may um, incent some people to retire before their time. And uh, so we've got to figure out as a team um, who gets replaced and how they get replaced and what's the skill set we need for the 21st century. So Militia and Josh are um, you know, leading uh, that charge. Uh, continuing on, we're going to have to continue to streamline operations. Um, uh, look, we have, um, take personnel for example, uh, we've taken all these disparate uh, personnel departments, every commissioner had their director of personnel and personnel people there, and right now we're um, pruning that back and reporting to a central uh, chief uh, human resources officer kind of used to that in the business world, it's time that we do that here. That means that person and that team on a, um, under DAS will have a, a government-wide perspective on the type of skills we need and how we do that going forward. And it's also some savings. We've gone from about 
360 people in personnel across the state, say, a year and a half ago when um, I came into office, down about 10 percent. It will be down another 10 percent as we can continue this consolidation. And I do think it's going to, um, you know, improve service and improve the quality and, uh, of, and function of the people that we're hiring. And more broadly, Melissa can talk about that's reducing costs. It's worth saying that um, uh, our costs were about 270, 270 million under budget compared to uh, what we had projected for uh, the year 2020. Melissa can talk about that a little bit, but we uh, realize that even in the face of the pandemic and our COVID-related expenses were um, paid back, we had to hold the line because we didn't know what our revenues were going to be, and for that, uh, we are very, very careful. That just gives you a little insight into uh, where we've got to be in terms of, um, you know, budget and cost. And uh, with that, let me just um, introduce uh, Kevin Lembo again to give his insights um, as, from the controller's point of view in terms of where we stand. Thank you, Governor. Uh, so uh, we could all use a little good news, I think. Uh, and ending the fiscal year of 2020 with a surplus is, in fact, good news and the transfer and capping out of the rainy day fund at above 15% right now is also very good news. As the governor pointed out, we have never had a number like that in reserves, um, and it took some discipline. Uh, in 2015, we had a long, hard conversation with the legislature about reserving some dollars in those most volatile revenue streams that we have. Volatile meaning they go up and down, like with the stock market. How about we capture some of those dollars, set them aside, for the next rainy day because we all know it's coming. Uh, and the appetite to raise taxes or to cut programs uh, into a deficit uh, was gone. No one should want to do that, and legislators certainly do not want to do that. So uh, now that we have exceeded 15 percent, as the governor put out, uh, or already said, the uh, difference uh, above that would be at the discretion of the treasurer uh, to invest in either the state employee retirement system or the teacher's retirement system, uh, or both, I hope. Um, and once we certify the uh, surplus for fiscal year 2020, that'll be sometime at the end uh, of the calendar year. It'll come back from external audit and make sure that my numbers are right. I think they are. Uh, then that money would also uh, come under the authority of the treasurer uh, to be invested in one or both of those uh, funds. So that's all very good news. Um, we went from April 30th, May 1st. A uh, 900 something million dollar projected deficit uh, to arguably small, but better small than none, uh, budget surplus of 39 million. Uh, so, that together with the balance in the rainy day fund, the productivity of our workforce, uh, Bloomberg saying we're one of the, four, the fourth most innovative state in the nation, uh, Connecticut is very well placed. Uh, and I'll just close by saying I would rather be the most innovative over the best performing today because innovation is about tomorrow and uh, it's a great place to be. So it doesn't mean it's not going to be difficult, and I'll let Secretary McCall, I assume, talk about what difficult is going to look like in the next two years. But, Governor, thank you again. All right, Melissa, we're all feeling pretty good. Tell me about 2021. Great. Thank you, Governor, and thank you, Comptroller Lembo. Um, you are absolutely right that several months ago we were facing a projected uh, $900 million shortfall, and I want to remind our viewers that two-thirds of that improvement was really due to the federal government's uh, receipt of federal revenues earlier than anticipated. And the remaining one-third um, was really related to some positive news and withholding and sales tax revenues amongst other revenue line items. The uniqueness of what Connecticut currently faces in a public health pandemic um, is that we've never had this experience before, right? And so some of the good news that you're seeing today really is the reflection of the very prompt actions that the federal government took to help lift up our economy. You know, over $6 billion in PPP that helped our small businesses, $1,200 economic stimulus payments so that we can spend and generate sales tax revenues, and robust unemployment benefits that help our withholding taxes. And so as we close fiscal 20 in a very positive position, the questions that remain are, what, how will our economy fare? How fast will people return to their jobs? Will the federal government continue to provide that economic stimulus? And so 
the Office of Policy and Management, in concert with the Comptroller's Office, will continue to monitor those trends. The Comptroller has certified a surplus, and those reflect revenues through August 7th. So here we are on September 17th. We have only one month of our under our belt, if you will, for the current fiscal year. So November 30th will be a critical time point. We are cautious because we respect the importance of making sound financial decisions for the state of Connecticut. And as we approach November 30th, we will update our projections if the trend suggests that we should do so. So what does it look like for fiscal year 20? We currently project a $2.1 billion deficit. Uh, the estimates assume that revenues will decline 6.6%. They've declined 2.3% in the current fiscal year. And just to make that very tangible, um, the adopted budget for revenues for fiscal year 20, about $20.2 billion, is a billion dollars higher than what we brought uh, for fiscal year 21, is a billion dollars higher than we, what we brought in fiscal year 20. So we'd have to you know, exceed last year's revenues in order to not have a, a, a challenge for the current fiscal year. And that's likely going to be um, unrealistic in light of uh, a public health pandemic. So we will continue to monitor. Uh, we have a $3 billion rainy day fund. We have a projected shortfall of $2.1 bill, $2 this year and $3.5 billion deficits in fiscal 22 and 23. That's potentially up to $8 million that we will have to solve in the coming years with a $3 billion rainy day fund, and I say that to do a level set. The governor on October 1st will submit a, his first plan for the fiscal year on how to approach fiscal 2021 to the legislature, and we will continue to monitor future consensus revenue uh, estimates. On a positive note, as you've indicated, Governor, we are always looking under the hood at opportunities to be as efficient as possible and to honor our commitment to our taxpayers to delivering the services that they rely upon in the most efficient manner. And Commissioner Jabal and I are very excited about the initiative that we will undertake um, with various stakeholders as we prepare for the upcoming retirements. With that, back over to you, boss. Thanks, Melissa, and um, happy to take questions. And, and Paul and Josh are here with us as well. NBC Connecticut. Yes, what is the makeup of that billion dollar increase from fiscal year 20 to fiscal year 21? Great, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, so first, um, a number of areas. So our entitlements uh, every year we estimate caseload growth, cost growth, so a portion of it would be entitlement growth. Um, our pension costs, you will recall that um, in CBAC 2017, we are phasing towards full payment of um, our ADEC, and so those costs continue to increase every year. You might recall that uh, the legislature made changes to ECS, um, and so there's also growth in, in ECS. So across the budget, there are a number of areas of investment there um, would be the uh, uh, adjustments to the minimum wage that have cost impacts on services that are provided by our private providers. Uh, so you will you will see investments and fixed cost growth that occurred across the budget um, that resulted in um, increased spending. If I can just translate for a second, when she says ADAC, that means required contributions to the pension fund. And when she says ECS, that means contributions to, uh, to our schools to make sure our kids are going to school. And Governor, regarding Raytheon, do you have any insight into how those reductions might impact Connecticut? Uh, we're getting uh, that right now. As you probably saw, uh, Raytheon announced um, a 15,000 person um, you know, layoff. Uh, most of those, or half of those, have already been taken, point number one. Point number two, this is Raytheon worldwide, so it includes Poland and Singapore and a lot of other uh, states around this country. Uh, I've been on the phone with Pratt & Whitney to see what percentage of that is related to Pratt & Whitney, uh, to see what, uh, how that impacts us. Pratt & Whitney has already had um, you know, most of their blue collar layoffs. It's related to commercial jet engines. You know, military is going strong, commercial not so much, to put it mildly. Uh, so I think you'll probably see, when it comes to Connecticut, on the uh, Pratt & Whitney side, mainly in some of the white-collar jobs. But uh, give us another few days. We're still working with um, Raytheon to get a better idea. 
And then, Governor, my last question. Senate Democrats are calling on you to fund and institute a COVID-19 testing plan for Connecticut public schools, saying there needs to be a more proactive approach on that end. Hoping to get your reaction. Well, I think I'll hand this over to Josh. But um, look, we can appreciate we can spend more money on testing um, if they want. But right now, we provide testing for each and every one of the teachers that needs it at absolutely no cost. And we're thinking about pooling in other ways. We might be able to do some more broad-based testing. But right now, uh, we're following everything the CDC suggests. Josh, anything else? No, I think that's right. I mean, we've been extremely proactive. Uh, Commissioner Cardona, our Department of Public Health, putting out extensive guidance for our districts about uh, how to safely reopen schools. And uh, we'll continue to answer questions. But uh, overall, we recognize that the unique circumstances that can come up in districts, um, you know, require local uh, knowledge and discussion with the uh, individuals involved and assessment of the risk. So uh, we'll continue to put out extensive guidance. We'll continue to provide resources and testing and PPE where needed. Um, but we're really happy overall so far with how uh, the reopening of schools has been going. Thank you. Thank you. Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Uh, yes, Governor, you know, looking at all of the financial numbers, ultimately, what should the average Connecticut resident take from all of this? It seems like we're good in the near term, but what should we be bracing for in the next year or two? I think um, it's a good time to be in Connecticut. Uh, I think you summed it up well. In the near term, uh, we've done uh, very well. Long term, we've got challenges. We knew we had challenges. And if uh, COVID doesn't get under control, that will impact our economy and everybody else's economy. And then it's really jump ball in terms of revenues going forward. But I think uh, what we should expect is it's going to be probably a pretty lean budget going forward in this, uh, this current fiscal year. And uh, we've got uh, the team to make sure we can do this, working prudently, having the rainy day fund as a backstop, see if we can do this without having to raise taxes or, or, or hurt our social safety net. And, you know, in that same vein, the CDC now says a vaccine would be widely available by late spring, maybe early summer of 2021. What would that mean for phase three of our reopening? Are we waiting for a vaccine before we take that next step? No, I, I don't think so. Um, I, I'm hopeful that we'll see a vaccine a little earlier than that. I, I'm not saying it's going to happen the day before Election Day. Uh, and then even when you get that vaccine, how widely available is going to be and who wants to take that vaccine as you build up confidence of people to do it. So I think uh, what CDC says is you may have the vaccine, you may have it available for first responders and other situations, but before it's widely available and widely taken, it could be the middle of the year uh, next year. You know, that said, I think we're looking at um, phase three. Obviously, for me, schools is a big part of phase three. And, uh, you know, Josh and, the, and Deirdre and the team, we're looking at um, what else we should be thinking about in terms of restaurants and events and the such. As we move into a slightly colder season, we'll be considering that over the next couple of weeks. Fox 61. Fox 61. News 8. Hi, Governor. This is Shana Ferreira. Uh, just a quick question regarding uh, the Norwich outbreak at the nursing home over there. Assuming the problems uh, Three Rivers were essentially realized because of the COVID outbreak, I'm wondering uh, why the conditions weren't known beforehand and other, if other facilities um, could have the same issue. Well, let me, I'll just say, and then uh, Josh can help me out. Um, we closed down that Three Rivers uh, nursing facility. We brought in an outside a manager to take, take control of this situation. It was obviously, we thought from our point of view, not meeting the key protocols we had to have. Obviously, the red light was when somebody uh, who worked there came back, hadn't followed any of the protocols. Before we could get that person uh, tested, the infections had taken place. But more broadly, we thought there were severe management issues there and thought it was time to take a change. And we'll do that again if we have to. Anything else, yeah. Josh? Yeah, yeah. thank you, Governor. I, I think it's noteworthy and was documented in uh, Department of Public Health's report on the matter that the 
nurse who uh, led to the outbreak was actually tested the day she came back to work from a vacation. So it's good evidence that the very robust testing program that the state has um, organized and paid for uh, for nursing homes has been incredibly effective. And as we look at the data across all of the other nursing homes and assisted living facilities around the state, uh, has been very effective in actually catching cases early and preventing uh, the types of issues we've seen and we saw at Three Rivers. Three Rivers, as the governor just mentioned, had a number of other circumstances related to it where procedures were not followed um, that led to that very unfortunate set of events. But overall, our nursing homes uh, have been doing a great job executing the testing programs and the, and the results are clear. Jackson, I guess my um, follow-up question to that, um, why weren't the conditions necessarily known there before this whole debacle? You want that, Josh? I guess I'm not sure what the question is. I mean, there was a, there was a specific event where you know an individual did not wear PPE when they were contagious before they were waiting test results while symptomatic. This was all documented in the report. Um, as a, as we've talked about before, you know, if you're sick and you have symptoms, you have to stay home. You can't go to work in this day and age. You shouldn't have done it even before COVID, but particularly now. And you have to wear masks. And the governor's talked about this over and over again. President Trump's CDC director yesterday in front of Congress uh, discussed the importance of masks and how masks could be the single most important thing that we can do in this country right now to prevent the spread of COVID. So when we don't, when people don't do those basic things, then risk is introduced. Um, and that's what we need to avoid. Gotcha. Uh, my last question, kind of switching gears here. Um, Halloween, about a month any idea on how any guidance would be uh, uh Your audio cut out. Could you please repeat the question? Sure. Um, talking a little bit, switching gears here about Halloween in about a month or so. Any guidance on um, what parents should start preparing to do if, um, if obviously the numbers are going up? Um, is the governor's office talking about Halloween and how you guys are going to address that? Um, we are. It, it's fairly timely. You point out the numbers are uh, creeping up a little bit, but I anticipate we're going to have a, um, a Halloween season. It's a, it's a time of the year when uh, people automatically wear masks. They often wear gloves, so it seems like uh, you're 90% of the way towards um, a safe way to do Halloween just by definition. Thank you. News 12, Connecticut. Hi, Governor. I just want to follow up on the request for testing kids in school. I mean, if we're testing teachers, why not test the kids, at least in some capacity? Look, uh, we're looking at that. But again, the CDC doesn't recommend it, especially in our schools. You have a positivity rate of much less than one percent. Uh, so uh, it was considered absolutely unnecessary. But for teachers to give them a sense of confidence going forward, we did provide uh, you know, free testing for each and every one of them as needed on a priority basis. And anything else on that, Josh? No, I think, I think that's right. Um, so you know, testing is available for children. DPH has made clear that um, children who are symptomatic or children who uh, you know, have been in close contact of someone who's tested positive or um, you know, as part of our general strategy to focus testing resources into some of our cities and urban communities that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID, um, children are certainly uh, welcome and encouraged to get tested in those environments. All right, thanks, guys. WTIC 1080 News. Hi, Governor. The 1.6 positivity rates, what are the doctors telling you about you know, whether or not that's the start of the surge, the flu season surge? I don't think we know, to, to, to be absolutely blunt about it. Um, there, that may be, uh, there may be some seasonality to this, but then we found out we thought it was going to go away miraculously when it got warm weather in the south, and just the opposite happened. It flared up. Uh, so right now we're watching this because it's gone on for, you know, 10 days, two weeks, slight, you know, one-tenth of one percent upticks, but a trend nonetheless. So um, let, let us track what seems to be going on. We're talking to our fellow states as well. 
what are your thoughts on the hecklers you've been experiencing the last few days? Uh, they say we're out of the woods, you don't have to wear a mask and go party, and I think uh, I refer back to question A, where the positivity rate is going up, we're not out of the woods, and the reason we've been successful is because we've been cautious about reopening. Dave, your new microphone sounds fantastic. Thank you. Uh, it's coming from you. That's tremendous. We, we'll move along to Connecticut Public Media. CT Good News. Good oh, oh, Sorry, go ahead. Um, in terms of restaurants and events, um, the time just seems to be kicking with the weather. Of course, it's New England. We don't know could possibly snow, snow tomorrow for all we know. I mean, is there a concrete date or, you know, you keep saying a few weeks where there could potentially be a decision to increase indoor dining. Um, I know you met with the Restaurant Association. How did that conversation go? Yeah, they said hurry up. Um, it, this is tough. And uh, while outdoor dining has been very successful, brought our cities back to life, and if I had the opportunity to have outdoor tables at my restaurant, uh, we did okay. We did okay. But um, as you point out, um, October is around the corner. Days are getting a little chillier. What can you do for me uh, with the colder weather? And um, we talked about some particular strategies. We took to heart what they said. We're meeting with the uh, public health people. I think it's uh, this week. So I'll be able to give them a, a clear indication of what they can expect over the next 10 days. CT News Junkie. Thanks, Max. I wanted to know, is there a central depository for the school-based infection data? Do we know how many kids and educators and teachers have tested positive in how many school districts? You got it, Jack. You got it. Yeah, we, we, uh, our State Department of Education and our State Department of Public Health um, have uh, are requesting that districts uh, report cases uh, both from uh, students and staff uh, up to um, thus far, um, the, as the governor alluded to earlier, um, there's uh, been relatively few cases across the entire state. So this is about 600,000 students and staff. We've had uh, reported 48 uh, cases among students and 27 among staff. So as the governor mentioned, that is uh, those cases uh, as a percentage of the total population is actually considerably lower than, than the rest of the state of Connecticut. So um, we, we will be collecting that data. We're planning to create a website to publish that. Uh, as we have done throughout this pandemic, we are uh, incredibly transparent about putting out all the data. So we know that that helps give people confidence and, and helps us make good decisions. So we're, we're going to have a website stood up pretty soon to uh, report that data out. All right. And, and Governor, I just want to ask on behalf of my five-year-old, on Halloween, door to door trick or treating, is the state going to have um, or issue guidance on, on door to door trick or treating? Yeah, I guess we have to issue some sort of a guidance on that, but um, tell your five year old I'm really hopeful um, she'll be able to get her candy. <sighs> Thank you. The Waterbury Republican American. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Governor, um, I have a question about basketball, specifically UConn basketball. Uh, apparently the Big East is uh, sticking to playing a 20-league uh, game so far this season, which might mean uh, Utah, UConn goes to some states that are on the uh, travel watch list. Are you considering requiring uh, UConn teams, the men and women's team, to quarantine uh if they go out to a, a state that's on the watch list, I mean, you, you said in July you were reluctant to allow UConn's football team to, to travel to states with high coronavirus rates. Yeah, Paul, that's a good question. Uh, we've got to meet with the, uh, uh, the basketball. But remember, I've looked at the NBA, the way they've done that in a bubble. And uh, so I've got to see how they're thinking about it for UConn basketball, whether those, are, um, those players will interface with the greater community, interface in classes, or they'll take – classes and meals as part of, um, you know, the basketball bubble, so to speak. So that would sort of impact how you think about um, those away games. Yeah, and I'll, okay. I'll add as well, um, uh, Athletic Director Dave Benedict has been in close contact with the State Department of Public Health 
in terms of understanding the guidelines put forth by the state. Uh, so as you know, uh, Paul, uh, with the updated guidelines dealing with quarantine as well as with uh, the test, uh, it, is, it is expected, and I know Dave Benedict and his team are well aware of the overall guidelines and have been working in close coordination with the state uh, as another season uh, come, come upon us. Uh, and what's the status with the uh, Toronto FC? Um, I believe there was going to there were some ongoing discussions about uh, quarantine measures. Has uh, there any resolution there? Anything new to report? You know what their quarantine plans are, yeah. Paul? So that, uh, yeah. So so as part of our agreement to uh, have them come into Rensselaer Field to play their games, uh, we went through with the public health department the protocols that they have in place. Essentially, they're going to be um, either in and out of the state very rapidly, or while they're here, uh, quarantining, um, you know, in their hotel or you know, in their residence. So uh, we're. Yeah, Commissioner Gifford uh, was very comfortable with the plans that they put forward, and uh, we're confident that uh, uh, that'll be a successful addition to the professional sports landscape here in Connecticut for the short term. Okay, and uh, Governor, to follow up on the, uh, the Senate Democratic, uh, the Senate the letter from the 15 Senate Democrats, um, you know, they're capable of proposing legislation to uh, authorize and fund such a testing program for public schools. But would you agree to add legislation authorizing and, and funding a testing program uh, for the special uh, session agenda later this month? Um, look, when I think it comes to testing, I got to tell you, Melissa set aside out of our CARES Act money more fun money for testing as a percentage than I think just about any state in the country. How you allocate that testing money between nursing homes and first responders and schools and colleges, you know, we can always look at along the way. Or if the legislature wants to spend more money, we, we can think about that. But I think right now we're on a very sensible track that seems to be working, and uh, I'd stick with it. Okay. And just to follow up on uh, Christine's question uh, regarding the uh, uh, reporting on uh, cases in the schools, uh, Josh, you said uh, the Department of Education and, and uh, the Department of Public Health are asking districts to report cases. Um, that sounds like it might be optional. Uh, will there be a requirement that every school district report their cases to this website so everybody knows what's going on in their local schools and not uh, have some school districts, uh, for whatever reasons they want, and uh, not report this information publicly? Yeah, we, we don't we don't have issues with you know non-compliance between our local school districts and the state. Uh, you know, when when data is requested, it comes in. Um, and I would also note, you know, where the communication and the transparency I've observed, and I think we're seeing across the state, is very strong at the local level. I've seen. I think we're seeing many school districts put up their own websites and be very transparent with their parents and their communities about what's going on. And we definitely applaud that. And I, I don't I don't think any of us anticipate any issues with uh, you know, not getting data out to the people who need it quickly. Okay, thank you very much. The Hartford Current. Hi, everyone. Um, Governor, the recent increase of cases has obviously coincided with the um, return of students to classrooms, not only on college campuses, but also all students. Do you guys see a connection there? Do you attribute some of the increase to the fact that students are at schools um, interacting with each other? You know, I'm not sure that we know, but I can tell you that uh, New York City hasn't opened their schools, has delayed opening their schools yet again for another two weeks, and, um, and they have a slight uptick as well. Remember, the word is slight uptick, but still it's a trend that's in the wrong direction. Uh, I think we've got to do a little more research to see exactly what's going on. I see Josh vigorously shaking his head. <laughs> <laughs> there. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think with regards to K through 12, I, I don't think so, Alex. It, the timing doesn't line up, right? As you know, from the time of, you know, a, a, a transmission event to when you'd start to see the cases, there's typically, a, you know, a two-week lag. And schools have just been coming in. By the way, I should mention that the numbers I quoted earlier about the cases that have been reported so far, those include students and staff who haven't even been near a school building. That, so that's anyone connected to a district. So even a smaller subset of that are people who've even been in a school uh, at this point you know, from a K through 12 perspective. Now, with regards to higher ed, 
Um, I think it's been well documented at this point that there's, you know, there's been a number of cases at UConn. There's been some at Central. But overall, um, you know, those are, uh, you know, seem contained at this point. I think the, the administrations there have taken all the right actions. And, um, but those do drive case numbers, as you know. Um, so we've seen some cases there. But again, there's no major um, areas of concern or outbreak. Um, a lot of small events that are driving some of the, the uptick, as the governor mentioned. Um, but certainly we don't see any connection to K through 12 at this point. So then we don't exactly know if there is kind of an underlying thing that is driving this uptick. It could just be a bunch of isolated things or there could be something underlying that we haven't really put our finger on yet. Is that right? I, well, I think there's a number of areas where we, we've documented very clearly where there's been some clusters of cases. Danbury is one that we've talked about extensively. Danbury's actually ticked back up a little bit um, over the last week, so we're keeping a close eye on that. Um, you know, what's going on in, in New Britain around Central and Mansfield with UConn, a um, couple other isolated small clusters here and there, but no other major trends. That was actually going to be another thing I asked with Danbury ticking back up. What is the situation in Danbury? Um, why has it risen again? And are we worried that it's sort of past the point where, where we can corral it? No, I wouldn't say that. I mean, we're, we're still below the levels we were when we took a number of interventions, you know, several weeks ago. Um, but yeah, we're, we're disappointed that the numbers ticked back up a little bit last week. So we're continuing to look at other actions we can take, continuing to flood a lot of additional testing into Danbury on a rapid response team um, and uh, make sure that the community is taking all the right actions to keep that uh, cluster contained. And Alex, Thanks, it's worth remembering that uh, Danbury um, never opened its K through 12 schools. So it's a difficult correlation between schools and infections. Sure. Thanks. Hearst Connecticut Media. Hey, Governor. Uh, so on Eversource, what are your thoughts on a provision that would require utilities to restore power within three days or face mandatory rebates to customers? Um, it really depends on what was the incident. I mean, if there is a, um, you know, Level 10 hurricane that knocks everything down, three days seems a little arbitrary. If it's a, a squall that knocks down those trees in selected areas, you can't get it back up, uh, three days seems a little permissive. So I think we're going to have to be a bit more um, sophisticated as we try and figure out what performance-based regulation means and when you exact a penalty and when you get a benefit. Thanks. And then also, uh, you said today you're in favor of trick-or-treating and and, um, and and possibly having kids come to the door. Um, so are you saying that everyone would have to wear masks, including the people who are giving candy out as well? Where's Where do you draw the line and how do you enforce that? Let me, let me get back to you in terms of guidance. Obviously, there are a lot of questions about how to do this safely, but uh, I think uh, trick-or-treating outside, wearing the mask, I think we can do it. The Connecticut Mirror. Governor, uh, have you issued a call yet for the special session? I think we're going to do that uh, later today or tomorrow. I've got to uh, double check on how the discussions with the leaders went. Paul Miles just made a face. <laughs> Make a face, face. Did you oh, nod, wait. Paul? There's, yeah, I did my usual wink. No, there's a. Uh, there's still conversations still going on as it deals with uh, the special session uh, in terms of uh, the agenda. As you know, the governor uh, is focused on a uh, focused agenda on items that are pertinent to, to now, uh, that has a sense of uh, urgency and of importance. I know that there's been, uh, obviously, there was a question about the uh, energy bill um, in terms of response to the most recent storm. Uh, that's a, a focus for the governor. Uh, as you know, today there was an informational hearing on the Transfer Act in which Katie Dykes and Commissioner David Lehman have been both working with uh, the chairs and ranking members of the uh, Commerce and Energy, I'm sorry, Commerce uh, Committee as well as the Environmental Committee. So uh, there's still some work that has to be uh, done uh, before finalizing a call, but we are in conversations with the legislature uh, going forward. And Governor, uh, Scott Dolch of the Restaurant Association uh, told me a little bit about 
your meeting and that, you know, the, the protocols that the industry is it talked about it, it, trying to get back uh, into the wedding business and uh, the holiday party business. So the last time I asked you this, you, you kind of hedged. So what's your thinking today? Is there a hard number, a hard metric that will dictate when you're going to go to phase three on reopening for uh, restaurants and uh, private event venues? No, I don't think there's a hard metric, but I did um, glean from my conversations with the restaurateurs and the event planners and the wedding planners. Um, look, give us give us some indication of what you think the fall is going to look like and give us that indication now. So I'm going to sit down with my public health team and they're going to say uh, October 12th is too far ahead to predict. And I'm going to say, um, look, if we can keep our metric below, say, 2%, I want to be able to tell people this is what you can plan on in terms of capacity and occupancy. That's where I think we're going with this discussion. Okay, but when you say 2%, you're not, that's not a hard number. You're just saying, for example. That's right. Let, let Deirdre read me the Riot Act first, then I'll report back to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but can you at least give them a time frame? I mean, you know. The- yeah, yeah, pass soon. I mean, I, I was thinking, hey, yeah. let's wait a little bit longer. I think we've got another couple of weeks of warmish weather. I think we can go. And, and they reminded me, um, look, they said, we are right now turning away um, reservations to do events uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas because people need to know. At least give us at least give us an indication of what the world has to look like for us to be able to say we could have a um, event with a hundred people indoors. And um, I owe them a response, and I owe them a response soon. Thank you, Governor. All right. Well, Kevin, I thought there'd be more questions about the budget, but um, I think it's clear, Governor. So thank you. Everybody is there. So, but we did have a lot of questions about schools, so um, we just wanted to put this up. Uh, you'll see um, these young kids on their way to the classroom, what it means to them. Uh, Nick Simmons has told me we're up at 39% of our K through five kids are now going full time for classroom education, and uh, it means a lot. As I said earlier, um, New York has shut everything down for at least another two to three weeks. California has no schools open. And uh, you know my feeling, if I can give these kids even a couple of months with their peers, with a teacher, what a difference it makes. So I wanted to leave you with what I thought was a happy picture. Take care, everybody.